Welcome back. Today we're digging deep into operating system concepts that are critical but often skimmed over in college. We'll explore the technical depths of processes versus threads, context switching, and memory paging, and how understanding them can significantly improve your code's performance. So let's jump in. First up, let's get into the nuts and bolts of processes and threads. These are both units of execution, but they behave very differently in terms of memory, performance, and communication. A process is an isolated instance of a running program. It has its own memory space, specifically its own code, data, and stack segments. This isolation is enforced by the operating system, which means processes cannot directly access each other's memory. Processes also have their own process control blocks, or PCBs, which store metadata about the process, including CPU register states, scheduling priority, and memory pointers. Thread, on the other hand, is a lighter weight unit within a process. All threads within a process share the same memory segments, which allows for faster communication, but requires careful synchronization to prevent data races. Threads also have thread control blocks, or TCBs, that manage their execution state, but share the PCB with other threads in the same process. Let's see this in code with Python. We'll be using the threading library to create threads and multiprocessing to create isolated processes. In this line, we create a shared list called shared data because threads in Python share memory within a process. Modifications to this list within thread task are directly visible here. Next, we create a thread that runs thread task, passing shared data to it. Starting the thread allows it to run thread task, modifying shared data in parallel. Thread.join ensures that the main program waits until thread task finishes, which avoids race conditions in cases where later lines depend on shared data. And finally, we print shared data, which shows the modified data because of the shared memory in threads. Now let's compare this with the multiprocessing library, which uses processes instead of threads. Now here's the difference in how memory works for processes. This line creates a process which isolates shared data, meaning process task won't modify the same shared data as the main process. Process.start and process.join starts and joins a process which works very similarly to threads, but data is not shared. Any changes to shared data within process task does not reflect in the main program because multiprocessing uses separate memory spaces. So threads are efficient for tasks needing shared memory, but processes are safer when you need strong memory isolation. Misusing them can lead to bugs or inefficiencies like deadlocks with threads or high memory use with processes. Now let's look at context switching and its costs. Context switching is the core of multitasking, allowing the CPU to alternate between tasks rapidly, but it has a hidden cost that can impact performance. When a context switch occurs, the OS saves the context of the current process or thread. This includes the program counter, CPU registers, stack pointers, and sometimes parts of memory. The state is stored in a process control block or PCB for processes, or a thread control block or TCB for threads, which allows the CPU to load a different task. Switching context means the OS must load and save each task's context, which takes time. The more processes and threads you have, the more time the CPU spends in this state saving rather than actual work. This is particularly impactful in systems with high levels of multitasking. There's a special condition called thrashing, where the CPU spends so much time switching that little actual work gets done. This can happen if the system is overloaded with threads or processes, making your program slower instead of faster. Limiting threads or using efficient scheduling can reduce thrashing. If you're on Linux, you can observe context switches using commands like vmstat. Look under the CS column, which counts context switches. If it's unusually high, you may have too many active threads or processes. Voluntary context switches occur when a process or thread willingly yields control, often because it's waiting for a resource, such as IO operations or sleeping for a specified time. For example, if a thread calls sleep or waits for user input, it voluntarily gives up the CPU, allowing another task to run. Non-voluntary or involuntary context switches happen when the OS 
forcibly preempts a running process or thread, usually due to a higher priority task needing the CPU or because the running task's time slice has expired. These switches are managed by the scheduler to ensure fair CPU usage and meet real-time or priority-based requirements. Finally, let's get a little bit technical with memory management and paging. Paging is a method that helps manage limited physical memory by using a virtual memory system. In paging, the OS divides memory into fixed-sized blocks called pages in virtual memory and page frames in physical memory. A mapping structure called a page table keeps track of which virtual pages map to which physical frames. If there isn't enough space in RAM, some pages get stored on disk, a technique known as swapping. So effectively what paging does is it allows a program to use more memory than is physically available by dividing memory into small fixed size chunks called pages and only keeping the active pages in RAM. The rest stay on disk in virtual memory until needed. And in this way, the programs can appear to have more memory as the OS handles swapping pages in and out of RAM based on actual usage and demand. A page fault occurs when a program tries to access a page that isn't currently in RAM, triggering the OS to load it from disk into memory. Let's see what happens when we run a C program that forces page faults by accessing a large array. This line creates a large array that requires more space than what's available in physical memory. This allocates the array on the heap, and because of its size, it will spill over to virtual memory, prompting the OS to use paging. Accessing each element here causes a page fault for pages not currently loaded in RAM. Each page fault triggers the OS to load the relevant page from disk, which is very slow. And finally, we free the memory to avoid memory leaks. When you run this on a system with limited RAM, you'll see increased disk I.O. and CPU usage due to page faults. Reducing page faults is critical in high-performance applications. To avoid excessive paging, you should consider working with memory in smaller chunks or using data locality techniques, which ensure that frequently accessed data stays in memory. And that's a wrap on these three advanced operating system concepts processes and threads, context switching, and memory paging. If you enjoyed this breakdown and found it helpful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to stay updated with more coding and tech deep dives. And if you'd like to support my work, you can buy me a coffee through the PayPal link in the description. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.